Call the meeting to order. Please stand. Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. Pastor Richard Hull from the First Christian Church will give the invocation. Thank you. A word first and then the prayer both will be short. I'm the interim pastor at First Christian Church after a long ministry. Joe Frittle retired in uh, April and I've been here since June filling in. My permanent home is Jacksonville, Florida, so I'm grateful that you folks allow a Florida boy to come to the mountains and pray. So, let a, let a, a word of uh, from a psalm, from a carol of the season, guide us into prayer. O come thou wisdom from on high, and order all things far and nigh. To us the path of knowledge show, and show us in its way to go. Gracious God, we come in the spirit of Emmanuel, of the hope of God with us, and pray that this night, this body, will act in the spirit of Emmanuel, God with us, that they will act with wisdom and knowledge and order things in this community for these citizens, for our people, that we might welcome the stranger who travels among us, that we might find a place for those who have no place to lay their head, that we might serve this community and be faithful here. All this we pray with humble gratitude. Amen. Amen. Thank you, sir. I want to go ahead and just quickly say thank you to all those that participated in the uh, parade, uh, especially to Angela, who got everything decorated for us. That was one of the nicest parades. It was certainly, if not the largest parade that I've ever been. And I've been up and down those streets before and seen lots of people, single file, double. But when you got downtown in the middle of town, there were some places where it was three and four people deep. So it was... Uh, it was amazing. So I think that was good. Uh, we've got a proclamation here for Barbara Hootman. Let me read this. Proclamation, Barbara Hootman Day, December 5th, 2016. Whereas it is fitting and proper to honor and pay tribute to Barbara Hootman as she begins a new chapter in her life following her departure from the Black Mountain News. And whereas Barbara left the newspaper on October the 25th, 2016, after 22 years serving the people of the Swannanoa Valley as news reporter at the Black Mountain News. And whereas Barbara is a native of Western Tennessee, grew up on her mother's farm where she loved, grandmother's farm, where she learned to love the natural world, a love that has come to occur throughout her life. And whereas Barbara attended the University of Tennessee where she taught, crafted her writing skills, and wrote some of the school's textbooks. And whereas Barbara has informed and entertained readers in the Swannanoa Valley for two decades with her lively stories about residents and their everyday lives and achievements, essentially writing much of the history of the valley. And whereas Barbara has attracted legions of fans with her weekly Whisper of Wings column that has explained the comings, the goings, and the quirky personalities of little creatures that live in the woods around us. And there now, therefore, I see Michael Sobel, Mayor of the Town of Black Mountain, do hereby proclaim December the 5th, 2016, the title of Black Mountain is Barbara Hootman Day, signed this December 15th. And I would like to go ahead and let Paul, if you will go ahead and give this to, to, to Paul here, please. This copy of the proclamation <laughs> that you will then give to Barbara, if you would come up, please. Mr. Mayor, the... Uh Barbara could be here tonight, of course, but she wanted me to let everyone know that how much of a privilege can be, it has been hers to cover the valley. So I'd be remiss if I didn't convey that. So on her behalf, thanks very much. We're going to miss her. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before uh, I go on to the next proclamation, and it has nothing to do with Paul, has nothing to do with anyone at the Black Mountain News, but it... I do take this opportunity as being the mayor to 
to go ahead and not only re reiterate what he said, but also to say that it's a sign of the times, and it's, a, it's not a pleasant sign of the times. Uh, when you have a newspaper that I grew up with, that all of us on this board grew up with, that talked about the valley, that was a true newspaper, and then you get these cuts that come in under the guise of having to go ahead and conserve and to <laughs> cut money and to save. And whereas you look at the newspaper today, it's not a newspaper much anymore. It's an ad paper. And that is one of the sad things. Because journalism is essential to what we do here. And if we don't have journalists out there who can go ahead and keep the watchful eye and do the deep stories and do the research, uh, it's something that we all have to be aware of. The second proclamation, uh, I gave this at the ball game down at Owen High School on Wednesday, but I'd like to read it again. Uh, this is the Owen High School girls team of 1964 to 1970. Obviously, there were many teams in that six-year period, seven years. Whereas on May the 7th, 2006, the Mountain Amateur Athletic Club and the Western North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame honored the Charles D. Owen High School girls basketball teams from 1964 to 1970 as the first athletic dynasty team in Western North Carolina. And I may say that there hasn't been a dynasty team recognized for them since. This special award is the first and only time a dynasty team has been recognized in Western North Carolina. Over that time, they lost only seven games and at one point amassed a winning streak of 90 straight games. And whereas in the formal proclamation, the team was honored by the North Carolina State Legislature for their outstanding record, and whereas the Owen High School girls from 1967 to 1970 Dynasty team led by head coaches Bill Rucker and Frank Watkins and assistant coach Pat Woodcock. Whereas Dynasty team members consider themselves to be more than a team, but affectionately refer to themselves as sisters. And whereas this Dynasty team was recognized for outstanding sportsmanship, composure, poise, and being under, cool under fire, whereas the Dynasty team prepared, prevailed due to superior physical conditioning, savvy coaching, dedication, and discipline, and whereas it is fitting to recognize the team members, many loyal fans, including families, Owen High School facility and classmates, many local businesses, churches, and loyal fans. And now I see Michael Sobel, mayor of the town of Mountain Dew, hereby declare that November 30th, 2016, in the town of Black Mountain was the Owen High School girls dynasty basketball team day. And I have to say that uh, fortunately, I happened to be at Owen from those 1964 through 1967, which was the 90 games that they were undefeated. Mm -hmm. And then the rest folks up here uh, graduated from the school also. So we've had quite a representation, but that's quite a feat. That's quite a feat. Uh, would like to have at this time, Marilyn Sabansky to come forward, please. And give us a little video. Good evening, everyone. While well, the holiday season is clearly in the works, people are excited, lots of bustling and hustling. And then it's also the time for Rainbow Recycling's uh, annual holiday recycling event. And um, I'm going to tell you about this, but since the picture is worth a thousand words, I have a short video to show you from last year's, which will give you a flavor if you've never been to one of them. Angela? Stuff coming in. Gosh, people are so happy to be able to get rid of this stuff. And not just get rid of it, not just trash it, not just put it in a landfill to be buried forever, but to actually get recycled. Potter came and got a lot of our packaging. She took all the bubble wrap we had. Got a lot of tree lights this year. Barely any the other year, and a bunch the year before, so you never really know.
pizza it gives you a little bit of the flavor of our events and uh, just to give you in full detail there are three categories of items that we take we take styrofoam other kinds of packaging and Christmas lights as you saw the styrofoam I'm speaking of is a pebbly type you know that cracks when you bend it um, and because this is what the recycler specifies it's the white styrofoam only needs to be clean and dry dust is okay and nothing attached which means no tape no glue or cardboard and also means because it's specified white no colored foam like no insulation that's blue or pink or any of that and no food containers this is packing styrofoam only we do take styrofoam peanuts but they are they don't go to the recycler those get reused the other category uh, other kinds of packaging bubble wrap air pillows brown packing paper and the other kind of packing foams there's one kind that's squishy and it bends it it flexes rather than cracks we take all those kinds but no cushion foam and again they must be clean and dry for very practical reasons because it's very labor intensive if we had to be there and sort every single bag we ask you to bring each different kind of material bagged separately and securely closed meaning that nothing can blow out poof out uh, leak out or whatever we often contend with wind and you can imagine with such lightweight material what that would do if we had to go chasing all over the parking lot at Hopi's running down the material the packaging is free to anyone who can use it as you saw we often have artists who come and get it shops and galleries home uh, business folks um, it's free first come first serve and it, it's amazing we often clear out most of what we've taken in and that helps save money for those folks and it's something that I really relish and seeing that reuse happen and we also like to take Christmas light strands um, we ask you to remove the bulbs beforehand now in the instance in the video you saw somebody didn't do that so except for the mini lights you don't have to bother taking those bulbs off but any bulbs that are larger please remove them first and then we'll just have a big bucket and you can put the strands in we do this collection as a community service each year and this year is our ninth annual event um, we're all volunteers so we request a dollar fuel donation for each large bag of foam that's just to help get it to the recyclers several counties away uh, businesses who have large quantities we really would like you to call us in advance to let us know so we can plan on it one year we had at least a hundred styrofoam coolers and it was quite something to deal with um, I have flyers all around town at the chamber at the library and I think um, Angela will be posting it as well um, it has these details everything I've shared so that uh, Saturday December 31st which is New Year's Eve but it's early in the day so it won't interfere with your eating plans um, 10 to 1 at Hopi's there on Highway 70 and should any chance by any chance the weather be really not favorable for the collection it will be the following Saturday same time same place Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you, Marilyn. Again, thank you for all the work you've done over these years. We appreciate that. Before we get on to citizen comment, I do want to ask if uh, our police chief, police chief, fire chief, Steve Jones, would come up and share with us a little bit about what has happened over this past month over in Broad River, Lake Lure. Uh, let's give us an uh, update on that. Well, luckily, we got some rain. So we're good. They did lift all the burning bands this morning officially. So before I talk about the Broad River fire, I, I do want to mention the Gatlinburg fire. Um, I'm like every other person and more so because I'm a firefighter. I've been reading everything I can about it. And uh, the Mr. Reed that lost his wife and two daughters, you know, he called his wife called him when she seen the fire outside her house. and. He told his wife exactly what I would have told my wife, called 911, uh, not knowing what was, get, what was getting ready to hit. So uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to everybody over there, and uh, I hope everybody else does too. That was a 17,000-acre fire that had over 25 spots. 
And when I say spots, if you're familiar with Gatlinburg at all, where that fire started, it took a span of about 14 miles and burnt from there to Dollywood. And within that 14 miles, it had 25 different fires. That's what a spot is. It starts one, the embers blow over, start another one. So they had 25 of those. And you imagine, I can't imagine having to respond and having that many fires in that location. So uh, that could happen right here. It could have happened right here in the last two months. We have a lot of communities that are up on the side of these mountains or in these woods that it could have happened here. We were lucky. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't so lucky. So uh, there are some things that homeowners can do that, that when you live and when you choose to build a house in the woods and live like that, uh, there are some things you can look up and things you can do about your house. And one of the best resources is ncfirewise.org. And it gives you some information. Actually, it gives you a little uh, uh, home questionnaire you can answer and it'll tell you how safe your, they think your home is. Uh, and then it'll have some more information about, a, uh, about landscaping around your home and things you can do to protect yourself from woods fires. So anyway, uh, that being said, uh, I am an advocate of home sprinkler systems. If you're building a house in the mountains and you want to, you should put sprinklers in those homes and they're only about eight, $8 a square foot. That's not a lot of money when you consider what people are spending for houses these days. And, um, when I first started in 1980, when we had a house fire, we had about 17 minutes to get out of that house before it burnt down. Now it's about three due to the type of construction, lightweight construction. So when a house catches on fire on average, you got three minutes to get out. That's, a, that's not much time. So uh, I would uh, encourage people that are building homes to, to talk, think about home sprinkler, uh, um, home sprinklers, and they are getting more affordable each day. Also, uh, uh, think about the firefighters. Uh, we, we do a, a, a strenuous job and a, 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 sometimes it's emotionally a tough job when you got to see the things we have to see and especially what they're looking for over in Gatlinburg right now. Uh, they're, they're still going through looking and they're fi finding people. I think today's death toll is 14 so, and they could find more. So uh, uh, firefighters are second among, amongst uh, PTSD and suicide in the nation, uh, second to law enforcement. So uh, it is a it is a, a tough job. So uh, please remember that when you you see them out doing their jobs. All right, back down to Lake Lure. Uh, the fire started on November the fifth. It was one mile from Lake Lure, and it was in uh, Rutherford, uh, Rutherford County. Um, I guess that is Rutherford County. Uh, then it. Uh, progressively moved and, and towards Buncombe County and on November the 9th uh, it was turned over to North Carolina State Forest Service. Uh, the fire burned approximately 7,000 acres with 2,400 of it being state park land and 4,600 of it being private land and only 656 acres were in Buncombe County and uh, that was in the Broad River Fire District and that's where the Black Mountain Fire Department amongst other fire departments from Buncombe County uh, we went and made our stand on that Party Rock fire. Um, the fire costed over approximately $7 million. Uh, when, when, and that sounds like a lot of money, but when you got to bring in the type of resources that it took to fight, combat that fire, I mean, we're talking about C-130 tankers dropping fire retardant in and helicopters and all kinds of uh, uh, equipment and manpower and stuff, so it does get expensive. There's over 1,000 firefighters from all over the state as far away as the coast, with crews from the Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Forest Service, Bureau of Indian Affairs, National Park Service, National Weather Service, Nevada, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Virginia, and Washington State. Um, they even have, I did see a picture of a Alaska crew came in, and they were on top of Chimney Rock, and they took a picture with the Party Rock fire in the background. Of course, you couldn't see the fire, but anybody from here would know what they were looking at, so I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, our engine 41, which is our uh, um, cast truck, our urban interface truck, it's got foam capabilities, it's what we use for these type of fires. It went over there on the 11th of November and it stayed till the 20th of November, uh, 24 hours a day and we manned that truck. Uh, five days in we did uh, manage to get, get it and change oil in it, the air filters in it and made sure 
uh, everything mechanically was good with it, and uh, so it stayed on the job for those amount of time. Uh, it did protect one house at number 10 Deer Lick Lane. That's where it spent most of its time, and uh, um, everybody did a good job. So um, I'm awful proud of my crew and uh, all the other crews that, uh, that were over there. We had approximately 705 uh, firefighting hours uh, and 273 equipment hours. Uh, one thing that not many people know that in order for us to go fight them fires, we have to have the same training that the Forest Service has to have. We have to have the same S classes they have, safety classes, saw classes, equipment classes. So we do the same training that the, the, the North Carolina Forest Service does to be able to go out and combat these fires. So amongst all the other training that we have to do as far as structural firefighting and rescue and that kind of stuff. So it is time consuming. But we do do the same training that the Forest Service does. Um, I believe, oh, on November the 25th, uh, uh, we had somebody go around and set eight fires in Black Mountain in 45 minutes. We do not know who that was. We didn't catch them, but we did catch all the fires and get them put out before they uh, got out to be big fires like was in Broad River. And I contribute that to uh, the, when all the dry weather came out, the fire chiefs in Buncombe County got together and we decided that we'd split the county up four ways, north, south, east, and west. And whenever somebody got a woods fire, we pounced on it. Black Mountain Center Crew, Swan Oil Center Crew, Rossville Center Crew, Broad River Center Crew, we all responded. And that day when we had those eight fires, we had a contingency out here. The man, it was something to be proud of. There was a lot of equipment uh, that came in here to help us, which, and we, we returned the favor. We did uh, go help other people in, in uh, uh, the response from the wildfires. Hopefully, we're getting out of fire season and we can cut back on that, but uh, uh, people seen a lot of fire trucks around town that day that weren't from here and that's what they were doing. They're kind of helping us combat these fires. So um, with that being said, if you have any questions or, I know that's quick. But. All I can say is my hat's off to you and your men. The idea. The idea that you didn't lose one structure. That's pretty amazing. That's by the grace of God. And your training. So. And also, too, I just want to share, you may have read it in the, in the paper. Uh, there were some comments and about the people that came in here, whether it's from Washington or Oregon or Nevada, and their stays up in uh, Montreat, and how well that they were treated by residents of Black Mountain and uh, even the little things like washing their clothes. Good job. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, we've got now citizen comment. Nope. Yes, yeah, yeah. Citizen comments next. We have one, Valerie Harris. Not the public, for the public yeah, I think yeah. she I think she signed up for one under the public hearing, so maybe she yeah. just should uh, okay. wait till then if she doesn't mind. All right, then communications from the boards. Brent's not feeling well. Dean's gonna give Dean us a brief update board. on the golf course. Give us a report on the golf course, please. I think Angela is going to show us a little video first that Brent put together. Brent came down sick this weekend, so I'm going to try to fill his shoes. Thank <laughs> you. 
Uh, that video was put together by Andrew Wood, who used to be a member and he moved to Scotland, but he has some skills in that area, so he did that for the course. I think it's a nice little video. Um, we have a little slideshow, too. Um, I'll let her catch up a little bit. So, go on one ahead if you would. The, the, some improvements that were done during 2016 is, some of these are just recent. They, uh, there's been a couple brown spots in, in the number 9 and 16 green. And uh, we, some of the trees are very close to the green. So we, just on the outside of the green, they cut a little ditch here and killed up all the roots because the thinking was the roots were coming underneath the green and, and causing um, some poor uh, grass growth. Um, we filled in a bunker on number 10 that doesn't get is out of play. Um, we're doing, doing full aeration in both the spring and fall. And th then we added a pencil tine aeration in, in the summer. Um, most people were saying we had the best greens in Buncombe County even better than some of the private courses. Um, during this last season, so we're real happy with, with what the greens are doing. Um, for the winter time, we, we on the next slide, we uh, we received a grant, which I'm going to talk about at the next meeting, but um, I think it's for about $75,000, and we're hoping to get a little bit more. But we're going to do some creek bake restorations on hole number four and five. I guess number three is there too. Um, the Tomahawk stream there is really digging away at the creek banks in a bad way. And um, there's going to be a little bit more of a gradual slope on those holes. But we're, it'll really be improving the whole watershed in the Swan Noah River. So we're very happy about that. Um, we're also replacing the, the main irrigation pump. I think it's about 25 years old. Um, it's been needing to be replaced for a couple years. The, the town budgeted $65,000 for that in the current year. Um, so we're excited about that. That should be completed by uh, early March. So uh, we're happy about that. Um, let's see, and, uh, some things that Brent didn't, you can stay here, but some Brent didn't mention, but we had some big drainage problems on, on the approach to the 14 green and we put in some drainage ditches and I think that was nicely dry this summer. Um, and yeah, so that that's it for the projects for the winter time really. Um, for marketing, you know, Brent really knows more about this marketing than I do, but I think we've, we've done some YouTube marketing through the Citizen Times, and he's been happy with the results there. He continues. Um, there's a website, Golf Now, which offers some discounts. Um, we're really just relying on the, the um, quality of the course to help us with uh, getting people into play, and it, the course has been looking great. Um, next we have... So here are the, the part that I'm good at, the numbers. Um, so this kind of shows you five years or so of cart fees. The big months at the course are July through September and April through May, or a April through June, I'm sorry. And the, the yellow highlights are showing you the best years we've had in five years from a dollar standpoint. So we're happy that like for cart fees, there's a lot of yellow on the left-hand side, which shows that we're kind of having record years. Um, sometimes it's not by a lot, but it's still, I'd rather have, I want to keep the yellows on, on the left-hand side. It also shows a five-year average on, on, to the far left. You can see that we've exceeded that um, really in the first six or five months of this fiscal year. So... Um, you know, you know, we're happy about that. We have the same, same slide for green fees coming up here. Um, again, a lot of yellow on the left. Um, we, let's see. 
our, our current, um, I think we have a combined slide on the next one which shows green fees and cart fees combined. Green fees and cart fees make up about 85%, 80% of uh, golf course revenues. Again, you see a lot of yellow on the left, um, particularly in these last couple months. Um, even the July and August there where we miss it, we really don't miss it by much, and our record year was in fiscal year 2016. Um, so, so we're happy with the direction of the revenues on the course. Um, we're just looking at that and seeing that that last year we had 408 for the year, we're 236 and for only five months. Yeah, you extrapolate I, that out, you're well over, uh, well over five, 500,000 then. Well, uh, th these next couple months, December, January, February, you know, you can see they're pretty small numbers. We'll, we'll be lucky to make 30,000 during those months total. But um, we're certainly ahead of schedule. Um, I don't know, it, it might approach five, 500, that would be nice if it did. That would be real nice if it did. Um, but, but, but I like the direction of, of how revenues are, are trending at the golf course. Um, and we talk about membership a little bit more on the next slide. We've, uh, membership rates have increased a little bit. We currently have 96 uh, paid members. The amount we're getting per membership is up to 863. Um, and that, that's a that, that third, that third bullet point is incorrect. It's not up. It was 680. So we've increased the amount we're getting per membership sold. Um, Brent has made some changes in the pricing um, on the course. I did some, uh, and this will show in the next slide, that really our, our rounds are staying about the same overall. Um, in, these, in the busy six months, April 1st through September 30th, we had 15,400 rounds last year. This, this year we're at about 15,200. So we're actually down, but overall revenues are up about $20,000. And that's really because of some of the pricing structure um, that, that Brent and, and, the, and the town board has uh, put into place. So, so we're making more money really on less rounds. Um, for the year, we usually end up with close to 21,000 rounds. So in these next, um, in the kind of the bad six months at the golf course, we're hoping to get about 6,000 rounds. And those would be the, the periods uh, October 1st to March 31st. And that is all I have on the golf course. But we're happy with what's going on, and I'm happy to answer any kind of questions if anybody has any. I think we certainly should recognize Brent and um, Jerry, yeah, Jerry and Joey. Has done a great I mean, job, they have course. done a tremendous job. Yeah. And I certainly haven't heard. The only complaint I have <clears throat> are the, the geese, the Canadian <laughs> geese that seem to love our right. area. And if I got a report for you then. <laughs> Oh, really? Oh, okay. But that, that really is the only pest that seems to be hanging around. <laughs> Otherwise, things have been great. We've had so many compliments on the course yeah, from the course other, other people that I come in that and play. Maggie and Larry are out there, and I think the mayor even played a couple holes a while back and shot in the low 70s. <laughs> <laughs> on nine holes. <laughs> <laughs> You're being too kind. <laughs> For three O's. All right. Thank Thank you. Good job. Thanks, Good job. Thank you. It's just nice to see when we flash back four or five years ago what kind of a problem that course was in and to see how it's turned 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 around. So. Okay. Consent agenda. Yes, sir. You um, you've got the ad adoption of minutes from uh, your September 27th closed session, your October 10th regular session, October 10th closed session, and October 13th special call meeting, uh, a November 7th agenda session, a November 7th regular session, and a November 7th closed session. So a lot of minutes. You have the adoption of the schedule for the Board of Aldermen agenda workshops and regular session meetings for 2017. Um, we do that annually, and you should have that 
uh, in your packet. I think it will still be the the uh, second Monday of every month and the and the Thursday prior to that for agenda agenda meetings. And obviously during the year, if there's conflicts, you, you're you're able to make changes with uh, with proper notice. So, but that's our regular schedule that you should approve prior to that. And then we and then as uh, from the agenda session, you know, we had added um, a resolution to rename uh, Rec Park Drive. To Veterans Park Drive, and I would request that, that under the consent agenda too, please. And those are those are your items. Do I hear a motion to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Any discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? To pass it unanimously. All right. Now we go to citizen comment, and this will end up being for the on the public. Um, Hearing road closure of Randolph Street. We have one lady signed up, Valerie Harris. I don't really have comments except that. Um, well, if, if you want to say something, please come up here. Baby. Do I need to? Say if you want, yeah. If you want to say something. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so Mark is our neighbor. We um, bought this old old house two years ago, and when we when we bought it, we thought we were buying down to where we joined with uh, Mark Manuel's property. And then about two weeks before closing, they said, we forgot to tell you that there's a road that goes through there. And they've done a wonderful trail through the woods, and we um, have thought we might um, raise bees or put a garden or something. So, and the road has never been, op never been used. so. That's why we thought we would approach the town about just closing it and just be done, you know, be done with it. And then we would know exactly where our property goes to. So if you would please consider that, we would appreciate it. Very good. Okay, thanks. Thank you. If you'd like, Mr. Mayor, we could have Josh from just kind of walk you exactly. through the, 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 the process for this. So for, for, for this one in particular, I know Alderman Harris mentioned you know, about notifying all the folks that were adjoining the, the right of way. And I think from what I understand on this specific instance, you know, the folks that signed are, are the ones that of course are requesting it to be closed and statute doesn't require us to have anybody else sign it. But we did notify everyone that adjoins the right of way from each side all the way across. So I think everyone's been notified from my understanding and I don't know that we've heard anything back from any from anybody that was that was negative or or I guess they'd be here tonight to to, to, to contest it. But it's it's around just getting to the to the um, to the right of way. It doesn't look like a right of way. If you went out there, you'd never know it existed. Around 35 foot in width and 460 ish, approximately in in length. Um, I know it was mentioned that Chip Craig I think is planning to do. Some development and actually it may already have permits now to develop on the other end which isn't being closed so I don't know that um, anyone has objected to this portion being closed you know this process usually takes only a month to go through the planning board however this one's taken I think it went three months it take, took to get through the planning board on this specific one unfortunately for the folks that wanted it closed you know and we have a list of stuff as you mentioned that we go through specifics like, you know, um, is there future greenway possibilities in this area? Storm drainage, you know, just a handful of different things that staff looks at. And, of course, we cross-reference that with, you know, our adopted plans, whether it be pedestrian plans or, or stormwater master plans, things of that nature. Um, so this one has taken a while to get, to get through and to get to, to this board. And, you know, staff has recommended that this portion be closed. We haven't seen anything in our research, uh, like I mentioned, about adopted plans. The, the actual, the Greenways Commission did comment on this one and didn't see a need for any kind of uh, um, greenway or pedestrian access to go through here. So that's that. We've got, if you've got more questions, I can try to answer those. not sure if that may have been too detailed or not enough. But. The rest of the board explained, you and I met up there, Last week, sometime, and explain exactly where the 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 right of way the, the the road is and what kind of terrain that is. Yeah, it's 
you know, when it comes off of Lakey Gap, you know, it's it goes down. It's pretty pretty hilly and steep through there, and I think there's a couple places through there where you've got a creek that runs through it. I know she just mentioned that there's a trail that you know someone's put in. You know that it's it would take some work to put any type of road through there. I can tell you that. Um, it's a pretty substantial work to put any kind of road through there. And or there's utilities. a road on either side. There is. Of of where they want to close this. That's correct. They didn't block any. No. Them. Okay. Do I hear a motion to open the public hearing? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. So we now have the public hearing opened. Uh, Valerie's already spoke, but in case she wants to speak again or if someone else wishes to speak. If not, then do I hear a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Now I need to get a motion to adopt resolution R1617 for the street closure of Randolph Street. So moved. Okay. okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So that street is partially closed. Next we go to the second public public hearing, which is the road closure of the entire street, Bridge Street, which is off of Vance Avenue. So Josh, if you'll lead us. Sure. So this this street, uh, you probably, if you went out there and looked at it, it looks really like a driveway. And that's essentially what it's been used as. It's located between a, a, the, the, there's a church. And I'm, I'm not trying to get this to load up here. I apologize that it's not. Uh, Victory Baptist Church and the uh, adjoining neighbor there, they requested it to be closed so they can put like a fence up. I don't know if there's, or for whatever reason, they want to be separated. And to make you know definitive driveways for each individual property, but this you know this is an extension of, of the existing Bridge Street. I guess it was never open. It dead ends right into the railroad right away there. Um, of course, every, everyone on this um, uh, uh, the adjoining property owners have been notified. There's only a couple, so it wasn't there wasn't a lot to to notify. I'm trying to get your. Uh, 30 foot wide and about 280 feet in length would be the portion that is uh, requested to be closed. And of course, we go through our checklist like we do on all the other ones with our adopted plans and and the, the need for future utilities and things of that nature. So, all right, then I hear a motion to open the public hearing on Resolution R1618. So moved. All in favor. Uh, opposed? Unanimous? Anybody who wish to speak? I hear a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? That's all. Awesome. So now to adopt a resolution R1618 for the street closure of Bridge Street off of Vance Avenue. All so in favor? So moved. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Maggie made the motion. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It's unanimous. Communication from staff. Thank you, Josh. I have nothing. Quiet now. And I have just a couple of things. I would uh, um, ask everybody to take a look in the hallway. You'll see uh, new framed photos. Those are from the uh, um, photo contest that Angela uh, organized and they're and they look really nice and uh, and we're lucky to have them and I think it's a real nice addition to town hall so please uh, note those on your way on your way out uh, wanted to point out that um, you know, obviously you all were at um, the uh, retirement ceremony for police chief Paget last week and and um, I've appointed um, lieutenant Rob Austin as the interim chief while we uh, begin a search um, for, uh, for Chief Paget's replacement, and so in the in the interim, especially over the holidays and the first of the the first of the years, really when we'll when we'll gear this process up, but uh, Lieutenant Austin will do a great job for us. I'm lucky to to uh, to have him uh, step up for the cause of uh, of interim police chief, and I hope that everyone will uh, will acknowledge him for that. And then finally, because Maggie mentioned it, um, uh, there is now a drone in my office. I don't know what to do with it, 
um, but it is, it is, it's, its role is, is uh, to get rid of geese on the golf course and at Lake Tomahawk. Um, uh, it just came in today. Angela spent seven hours cutting all the uh, bubble wrap and tape off of it, and uh, we will uh, we'll, we will uh, um, put it put it together and uh, begin the process of training for for that. And I would and so I guess my point would be though, if you see a drone flying around Lake Tomahawk and the golf course, first of all, don't shoot it. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, secondly, just re recognize that we are trying to humanely move geese to uh, somebody else's property that is not ours. Um, but uh, but that's, that's right, that's right, that's right. But uh, but that but that has but that is that is here, and uh, and uh, and we look forward to uh, to the next step past the dog silhouettes and how we resolve. Our, uh, our our geese issue, and we'll and uh, and I'm excited about that one too. And that's all that the, I have. Um, and the way this works then is that it's got speakers, yeah, so small speakers right. on it. It's got a little recorder, and so that recorder has got red tail hawk on. Well, it. Well, I don't know. Else? It says it, the thing says predator noises, and I haven't been and I couldn't get that to work yet. So um, I don't know what the you know. Yes, it's 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 hawks, and I, what else? I don't know what else. What you know. Don Collins with his shaking his fist at uh, the geese. It could be, it could be a, it could be a variety of uh, predator noises, probably. But, uh, but, but yes, it, that's what it has a speaker, and, and it is supposed to. Uh, um, when, when we, when we perfect it, uh, we will, we will hopefully. It might move terrorize the citizens more than it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it might. Yes. They, if they're citizens that you don't want on the golf course, oh, right. that's <laughs> that's right. Right. <laughs> well, but it's also going to be used for around the lake. Yes. Because yeah, because the, the geese are a problem around Lake Tomahawk. Yeah, there, there's a variety, and, and frankly, I mean, I, I think, and not to not to go on and on, not to drone on and on about the drone, but but it uh, but it does, it will have. I think as we as we evolve, it'll have a variety of of, of uses. It has a plug-in for a GoPro camera and some of those things, and so there's some opportunities that we can that we can use the drone for once we're once we're skilled. The initial um, uh, uh, use of the drone is to is is to help with the geese population, and that's how it's, that's what it's designed for. That's what it was built for. And that's why it has a speaker on it. And once we figure out how not to wreck it into the woods, we'll um, we'll continue to do that. But 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 it is it is here, and it is uh, ready to ready to go as soon as we know what we're doing. Is there an initial launch date? No, there is not. <laughs> I, I, I will announce that as soon as I. As, I don't want to make it. I don't want to embarrass myself with. Uh, Maybe I could ask my my, my uh, nine year old son to uh, he, he could probably do it quicker than I than than I will ever figure it out. But 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 I will say that I, that I've got a call in to uh, to the guy that built it tomorrow, and he he's going to walk me through putting the pieces together that were because he put it in two boxes and uh, putting the pieces together for how we do it, and uh, and then and then I will call you first when it's out. How about that? Excellent. Sounds good. Anything else I would like to go ahead and say before I turn it over to the board for comments, everybody, have a Merry Christmas. It's been a great year. Let's hope we have a good one next year. Yep. That'd be my only comment, too. I second the mayor's comment on that. Merry Christmas and staff, Matt, everybody on staff and our citizens here and those that will might watch the recording. It's, uh, we're very blessed to live here, so Merry Christmas. I'd like to say Merry Christmas also, and I just need a clarification. Um, Matt, Josh, and Casey, are you guys going to be playing Santa Claus somewhere, or are you auditioning for the Popcorn Sudden <laughs> Fan Club? Wait, this, All these beards going on. We're, we're trendsetters. We're trendsetters, and don't don't be don't be afraid to grow a beard, Carlos and George. <laughs> <laughs> Looks good. Though. Even, even, even All right. Fred's getting into it. Yeah. Very good. See you next year. Meeting adjourned.